So Steve, take us back before real estate. What were you doing and what led you to get into our industry? You know, it's interesting you say that because when I look back and I say to myself, what groomed me to become an entrepreneur? My very first job, if you will, was actually an entrepreneurship. I was a paper boy. And a lot of people today don't look at it like that, but we bought our papers wholesale. The size of our route mattered. If you had a 100 paper route and you bought your papers for 100 bucks and you sold them for 150 a week, you make $50 a week. But if you had 300 people on your route and make 50 a week, then you're gonna make more money. And there was a little bit of opportunity in collecting. You actually would go back to the door and knock on the door and ask them for the dollar or the 90 cents at my time. And if you could get that 10 cents, that was a 10% tip. And this was back in the early 70s. I think I was 10. And I had a paperboy route from 10 to 18. Even in my high school, nobody knew that I got up at 4 a.m., and work till 5.30 and I was done. It's kind of like doing the 20% in the first part of the day, I did. And then I never ever was broke. I always had cash. And then from there, my next job, I went with someone to uh, a swap meet and they were selling uh, sunroofs. They got them wholesale and they were selling them a little below retail at the swap meet. So I could pick up a sunroof for about 30 bucks put it in for 199 and make $169 profit. So I started Blue Sky Sunroof. <laughs> and the beautiful thing about that is when I would give them their car with that sunroof, they would fill it up with gas and take a drive with that roof open. It was one of the most amazing things. And all I would do was roller skate through Los Arcos Mall, put flyers on cars, go home and sit in the pool, have people call me and go, ah, the life of a young entrepreneur. <laughs> I love it. I mean, and, and already just in those first two examples, what I, what I hear and pick up on immediately is even at an early age, you knew numbers. You knew your numbers. You knew that spread there. And you knew that if you could create a spread, then that was profit. And if there's profit, then you have a business. Very cool. So bring us into real estate. Like why, why did you settle on real estate? It was interesting. Real estate, I uh, got a scholarship for wrestling. And so in between the summer before I went from high school to college, my dad said, you know, you've got three months. Why don't you get your real estate license? And I turned 18 at uh, uh, halfway through my senior year. So I was able to start studying in April. And by June, I had my license and started working with my dad. And I kind of had a knack for it. I knew a little bit about sales. I knew a lot about people. And uh, I think I made about $60,000 in my first three months back in 1977. And boy, I tell you, I went, I went to college, but it was a little tough to stay focused. <laughs> when you have that much money in your pocket, um, I pretty much decided I would keep trying to go to college, but I, it didn't take much more than a year, year and a half that I was full time in real estate. Okay. Well, you get quickly into real estate and you start to build a business and sometimes, you know, sometimes people have the foresight to begin with the end in mind. Um, and yet I'm curious from your perspective, like back in those early days, did you know what you, it was that you wanted to build or why you wanted to build it? Or were you just kind of figuring things out? I'll be very candid. And I, I'm actually getting ready to teach a class that's uh, it's very much similar to what Gary Keller would teach slash preach. Think like a CEO. Uh, but if you don't know what a CEO is and you don't know what the benefits are, how do you know if you want to be one? So I've done a real deep dive in why you would want to be a CEO because I knew early in life I had one goal. I wanted to be an international marketing consultant. I had no idea what that meant, but like anyone you say, I'm going to be an astronaut, I'm going to be a fireman, you're going to be something. And I knew I wanted to be an international marketing consultant, 
be smart enough to consult with anyone within my field worldwide and not hopefully, definitely be the best. That was my goal. And so quite candidly, my career, uh, everyone should have a niche when it comes to real estate. And in that niche, you need to have at least three legs of leg of lead generation. And for sure, everyone uses their sphere of influence, their family, friends, workers, colleagues, anyone that you know or surround yourself with. And that's one of your legs. And that's great. Uh, then from there, you now have to pick something that's proactive, something you can do that you can put in your effort and uh, learn through trial and error and hopefully take the action, learn, repeat, take the action, learn, repeat. And so in that process, I learned that you could get listings at a very uh, early point in my career from builders uh, and that particular niche was builders are open seven days a week 10 hours a day from 10 o'clock in the morning till six o'clock at night people go in all the time and some of those people don't have an agent and they have a house to sell and so in any given subdivision there may be lots and lots of you know at least two three people a week if you work with 10 communities just like the papers if you have a few more papers so 10 com one community three leads a week eh. 10 communities 30 leads a week listing leads from a trusted reliable source that the buyer slash seller likes and trust so that's been my uh, that's been my niche is working with new home builders. But as it relates to why become a C, uh, CEO, you go back and you say to yourself, you got to ask that question about vision where you start with the end in mind. Well, what I would say to make it really simple, start with the end in mind, just say, I want to be success, whatever that is. I feel good about it. I'll have enough money to do what I want to do and give what I want to give and be able to live the kind of life that I want to live. And I don't think that has to be pigeonholed into, okay, doing what? Because you're going to do a lot of things in your life. And everything you do is going to roll up and teach you through failure how to do things better. And that's, you know, ultimately at the end of this podcast, people are going to say, Steve failed more than anyone I know. I failed in my family. Our family was so dysfunctional. My father beat the hell out of us. Could have literally killed my mother. She went in a coma for four years. I hated my father with more... Oh, man, you have no idea. Watch your mother die for four years. But that's, that's a, a horrible place to be stuck. And if you don't overcome that, it will kill you. And it almost killed me. Drugs, alcohol at night, real estate by day. Nobody would ever know the difference. Fast forward 10, 15 years through a lot of praying and just saying to myself, I'm going to stop because I was a wrestler and wrestler creates the habits that create disciplines and disciplines create mindset. And when you've got a good mindset, you can conquer anything. So say that, say that one more time. I want to make sure listeners picked up on that. Habits? Habits create discipline. Discipline creates a mindset, a positive mindset, a mindset of conquering anything that you set out to conquer, period. So is it sort of the idea, Steve, of proving to yourself through your own actions and results that, uh, wow, I am tougher than I thought I was. Wow, I can follow through the way I thought. The discipline leads to the positive mindset because you're proving to yourself that you are capable of what you're thinking. Absolutely. 100%. You nailed it. Do you know if you had that same level of awareness when you were starting in real estate? You said, you know, you made the point you wanted to be the not just any international marketing consultant and not hopefully the best, but but definitely the best. Right. And so do, is this a is this a mindset that you've carried with you your whole life or is this something you've sort of developed as you're becoming kind of more aware, reflecting on your past? So I'm reading a book called The Psychology of Money. And one of the interesting things that I read, I'm doing the 75 day hard, so I'm not drinking all that fun stuff and I'm reading 10 minutes a day. So my aha today was twofold. I'll share the second one with you at the end of the podcast. So make sure you ask me that one. Um, 
But the one I learned today was that risk and luck are siblings. They're brothers and sisters, they're brothers, whatever. So there's luck in everything, but there's risk. And I wrote a book called Change. Took me two minutes. You can look it up on Amazon. Change by Steve Ryder. And I've got a guy that one of the first uh, photos is a guy that is walking a balance beam from one canyon to the other, and there's nothing below him, like maybe a 2,000-foot drop. And I ask people, what did he get first, courage or skill? I'm sensing that's not rhetorical. <laughs> no, you yeah. have, I mean, you guys answer it. What would you, if you were going to walk from the Empire State Building across to another building, would you have to have courage first or skill? I would imagine some level of skill would then open up the possibility in your mind to have the courage to take on something so big. Exactly. I don't care how much courage you have. You walk out there with no skill and you're going to die. Right. So don't be stupid. So that takes us back to risk and luck. Luck is when opportunity meets preparation. That's it. You can cheat on luck. If you cheat on luck, risk goes down. So one of the first things I excelled at in life was diving off the high board. The risk, eh, belly flop or a back flop. Lucky if I try it, time it right, everyone's going to go woo. <laughs> right. And before long, all eyes on the high board. And that was one of my most awesome feelings it was the mm. first thing i conquered was diving and then it was roller skating i was the smallest guy but i was a speedy little guy and through lots and lots of effort i became very good at long distance i couldn't beat the big guys in the in the short distance but i won the five mile race and i was 11 and everybody else was 17 18 or 19 wow and i fell in the first lap and that's what made me win because I was way behind. So you find this, you find this niche with builders and you're like, okay, I can expand my lead pool through this. Like what happens to your business once you discover this? So our business grew pretty big by most, uh, by most standards. So we were doing 100 transactions a year. Uh, having a solo team, and then 200 transactions, and then quite candidly, I got my wife out of the corporate world into working with me and my team, and that changed everything. You know, you always hire to your weakness, and by far, administrative duties are my weakness. And so she stepped in, and that was her strength. And I'll never forget, uh, in like 2013, I think it was, I decided I wanted to be a coach so I could go to the next level and coach uh, at a very, very high level. And I said to Beth, hey, are you ready to run the team? And that year we did 357 transactions. I said, you know, the way you're helping and doing all this stuff, maybe someday you'll do 800. And she goes, Steve, I don't want to do 800. That's no, no, no. <laughs> Five years later, she did 1,208. So behind every good, successful person is someone else. And that one is my wife, Beth Ryder. And so the niche that I expanded was time on task over time. And same exact concept as the paper boy. If you get one uh, builder and they've got three subdivisions, that's great. You get four builders and they've got 10 subdivisions. Now you've got, you know, 43 and then Gary said, before you expand, make sure the ink blot theory, make sure that you've got your home base covered. At that point, we had three builder agents. I immediately hired four more and we had seven. So with those seven agent opportunities, Beth was able to administrate them and lead them and guide them to where we are now. While I took off and did a whole different uh, thing, becoming the last goal of my life, the CEO of the International Builder Trade-In Program. That's absolutely fantastic. So we have a, a wide range of listeners, Steve, and some are asking, okay, I don't even know how to approach a builder. Like, 
that's a new concept to me. And so what would you give as far as advice to an agent who might be in a market and they see the same, you know, open door of possibility? What do they need to know? Okay. So we're going to talk about two agents out there, guys. If you're anywhere from a $1 million producer to about a $20 million producer, you're still in your stages of doing a lot of buyer business. And you should absolutely go to NHA, newnha.com and get our free website. It's a new home ambassador. And our slogan is realtors specializing in new home construction. So imagine you're, uh, you're a car jockey, you're selling cars and you sell used cars and you're not selling enough. You're not, you're not making enough money. Wouldn't it be nice if you could work on a lot that has new cars and used cars? You would have twice the inventory. That's what you realtors out there need to think about. The more inventory you have, the more money you'll make. So now start specializing in new home construction and residential. Your buyers want one or the other. And with the pandemic, they're looking at newer more than they're looking at old and tired homes. They're looking at clean. They're looking at smart. They're looking at healthy. So you can simply become a new home ambassador by exposing yourself to the new home market. Go out and visit communities. Understand the dialogue. Become relevant. When you walk in, if you say to them, hey, would you guys mind demonstrating the first model? They're going to treat you with respect because that's their lingo. When you say demonstrate, they're like, oh, my God, is this my boss? Is this a secret (laughs) shopper? Because they're telling me to do my job. Get up and show me the first model, what's included, what's not included, and the features, and more importantly, the benefits of those features. Now, that's the first step. Now, the people that I coach are the top 1% in their area. If you're a high-level team and you've been thinking of getting into that builder arena, That needs coaching. Absolutely 100%. If I've got the territory open, I'm willing to coach you. But I've taken people from 100 units to 800 units. I helped coach Lance Loken. A lot of people that you would know out there because you can add 100, at least 100 to 300 units if you're a high functioning team by specializing in that builder arena and adding that as a lead generation leg. So let me ask you this because you you mentioned that when Beth entered into the business with you, um, your strengths um, and weaknesses complemented each other and you commented on the administrative piece uh, being the th- area where you needed to add strength. Talk to talk to us a little bit about the importance when you're scaling from 300 to 1,200 transactions. That takes a lot of operational efficiency. What were some of the things during that scaling period that you know you really had to tighten? You guys had to tighten up. That's a great question, and I'll answer that and kind of defer back to why become a CEO. If you're a real estate agent. There's some benefits of being a CEO. There's actually 11 benefits of being a CEO. And a lot of them are inherent that you think if I work for myself, I get to make all the decisions. (laughs) Yep, you do. (laughs) But the buck stops here. Yep, it does. Can you affect change faster than anyone else? Yep. So there's a lot of benefits, but you need to actually articulate those benefits and make sure they're in alignment with what you personally want to do. Whether you're a one-man CEO, you're still the CEO if you understand what that position entails. And why would you do it in real estate? Because real estate has a lot of ancillary businesses and ancillary opportunity. So once you become a CEO of your own company, that's what it took me from 1998 to 2001 at Keller Williams to change my mindset. And that was because I thought Gary was wrong. (laughs) I kept going, no, Gary, you're wrong. Gary, you're wrong. I believe in everything you're saying, but you're wrong when it comes to the fundamentals. And we had a big difference. I thought you could pay 70, 30 and run a profitable business. Well, you have 30% in expenses. 
So if you give them 70 and you have 30% in expenses, what's left for you? Mm. Zero. Zilch. <laughs> so then Gary said, well, if you only give them 50 or 40, if it's a listing agent and you have 30%, what does that leave for you? If it's 40 plus 30, now you get 70. So you get your 30. So now we net. 31 to 34 percent of our gross every year but i had to buy into the fundamentals i had to buy in that i was actually in charge of my own company i had to believe i was the ceo and at that time gary said so who wants to be a millionaire in my group everybody raised their hand but me i didn't really feel i had the self-confidence that i could accomplish that and that was just from some of my upbringing. But the practice, the affirmation, is not an affirmation. It's a declaration. I declare that I'm worth it. Didn't take long before those sessions got to 10 million, 50 million, 100 million. The last one, 8 billion with a B dollars is my goal. But I made a deal with a partner. And I said to that partner, I'll give you half if you help me. And he said, yes. And that's the Lord. So, so I want to dive more into builder trade-in and new homes because I think this is a huge opportunity. We were talking a little bit off air about skating to where the puck is going. And it took a lot of preparation to get to a point where you find yourself now. I mean, what do you think is, what do you believe is going on in the market right now that makes new homes such, such a thing that agents should be focused on? Great. I'd love to give you a little history. So within the market, we've always, since we've been pretty much keeping records in the early 1960s, built to the population growth. And in the new home arena, that's a million to two million homes a year. That has just been common all through the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, 2000s. We build a million to two million homes. It wasn't in 2007 that we went to 900. And then 2008, we went down to 500. And then 2009, we went down to 300. And as we came down, there was a deficit of homes that needed to be built or we were going to have a shortage. So we have a shortage because they weren't built. And so fast forward till today, we're maybe going to hit a million, but we're short by two million. So like toilet paper, anything you have a shortage of will go up in price. So that's the first fundamental thing. New home construction has a shortage, so it'll take a while. And while we're building new homes, because they're new and because the products are more expensive, they will be more expensive, but it's a better value, like buying a brand new car. Only it doesn't lose 25% off the line. It gains 25% in the first five years. So it's diametrically opposite than to buy a new car, but it's the same theory. It's got all the new bells and whistles, and certainly it's safer and has more technology in it. So the new home arena is definitely a place that you need to be experienced in, because if not, your repeat and re referral customers in your database are seeing that you're not a specialist in that arena. All they want from you is as simple as my new home ambassador website so you can drip on them every friday we call it new home friday you send them uh, what the rates are you send them an inspirational quote send them any builder video that you've done during the week and your builder search tool so they can search for new homes on our website if your consumer like my one of my clients goes in and says i like this house and they click on a kb home I get notified. It happened last week. I called the buyer, had a nice dialogue with them, and they let me know that their mother or the guy's wife's dad was their realtor. And I still sold them a house. Why? Because I was a new home specialist 
and her father wasn't. So if this new home deficit began in 2007 area and over the last decade, can you speak to why we haven't been able to catch up and we're still two million homes in the hole? And how do you see that playing out over the next few years moving forward? So we've been catching up, <clears throat> but the industry inherently has a two year lag time from buying the dirt to the lots are ready. So you're always behind. So as you were cautiously optimistic was the phrase that every builder used in, you know, 15, 14, 16, 17. They were just cautiously optimistic, building a little more at a time, regaining momentum because they lost it all. So they had to reform companies, get back their subs, get all that chaos going and then go buy new dirt. And that dirt just takes time. And so it all kind of took time, took time as they were cautiously optimistic. And as the market was getting ready to roar, we were all wondering what was going to change. And it wasn't the economy. It was the pandemic. And the pandemic cost a run on new homes, which just exasperated the issue. Right. And without builder foresight, they sold their whole year supply between January and March. And now the sales managers are walking around going, wow, life is great. Look at me. Sales agents are like, this is a drag. <laughs> Consumers like, well, can I buy one? Yeah, highest and best. Right. And all the while, builders were buying more dirt because, oh, my word, if this keeps up, we're going to be rich. So everybody bought dirt. Now the demand has slowed and the resale inventory is coming up and we have a tsunami of new home lots coming up and lumber uh, thousand board foot has gone from seventeen hundred and eighty four dollars to four hundred and ninety seven so there's just a little bit of you got to be very strategic and most of the strategy today for the builders is don't price it until it's at frame well, now what you've done is you've shortened your, your selling time from 10 months to five. So you're to see how you're building that demand. Mm -hmm. Are you building yep. that supply, not demand and consumer confidence is down. Consumer sentiment is down. Interest rates probably will go up because inflation is definitely up if you can't read between the lines you are not listening so we've got all these builders that are reorganized we've got the cost of raw materials going down we've got this tsunami as you said of new home inventory that's about to hit the market hence your passion for telling real estate agents to begin their new home builder experience and knowledge and getting into those relationships so that they can add that to their repertoire of services, so to speak, to their inventory uh, of their used car lot, as you mentioned, so they can sell more homes. Absolutely. And it's better for everybody. Builders, consumer, agent, everyone. Tell me a little bit about, you mentioned briefly this, this NHA, this new home ambassador program that you're working on. What is the, what is the purpose of that? What can an agent expect to receive from that? How, how does that, how does that help the, the real, the listener right now listening to that if they're interested? Oh, you bet. So go to your phone. If you're listening, if you're driving, don't do this, but if you're <laughs> stopped, just punch in new N E W N H A, which stands for new home ambassador.com. And you'll go to a website, you'll see my private plane, it's logoed of course, and uh, actually that's not really my plane, but you can think it is. Not yet. <laughs> not yet, there you go. Eight billion. Uh, <laughs> there you go, baby. <laughs> so when you get there, just scroll down, you can see some of our stuff, but it says, what does an agent site look like? And the beautiful thing about what does an agent site look like, it's, it's branded to you, has your picture, has your uh, DRE number, has a call me button, has a search widget so they can search for any new homes in their local area or around the United States. When they actually save one, the, the agent gets notified immediately. And I tell you, if you call immediately, last week I called three out of three and got three out of three sales. Wow. The other five that I didn't get to within 30 minutes, I'm still chasing them. 
So it is speed to lead. Speed to lead. Still matters. Still matters. And then we've got interactive kitchens. You want to talk about sticky? When you guys go to that new NHA site and look at what does an agent site look like and you go down to interactive kitchens, those are kitchens that you can actually change the flooring, change the backsplash, change the cabinet color. Boy, does that give you stickiness and an ability to talk to your clients. So you, not, you shouldn't just send it to them. You should call them and say, hey, I need your help. I'm rolling out a brand new website and I want to know how valuable it is. It has all new homes. It gives you an opportunity to, to modify the kitchens. And guess what? If you want, you can take a picture of your kitchen, upload it. And as long as you buy a house through me or you give me a referral, I'll get it digitized for free in case you want to do some remodeling. I love that. Here, here's the brilliance in just that that you need to be picking up on. It's that you are providing a piece of value that's ancillary to the transaction in most cases, such as designing a kitchen, and there's a stickiness. That's the word that you used. And so it, whether it's designing a kitchen or something else, an agent, you need to be thinking, how do I keep, like, what's the sticky power that I'm offering to the consumer? And not a lot of agents think like that, and they, they need to. They're the CEO of their business. At least they should be, right? And so I think there's just a brilliance even in that piece of value um, that you're offering to the consumer. I want to dive back into you know your, your story a little bit because you also, um, Steve, not only have grown an incredibly large business in this niche, but you also um, you know have this passion for coaching and training agents, and um, you, you you went into brokerage leadership as as well, and had a lot of success there. What was it that that caused you to not take a hiatus from the business, but also go into the the brokerage leadership? Quite candidly, it's always been inherently in my soul to help. It just, uh, you know, Gary Keller, when I first met him, he did what's called the book on me. <clears throat> and uh, the first thing, yeah, well, actually, I can just fast forward to the quick answer. When I said to Gary, should I take my, can I take my program nationwide? He said, why? I sent him an email. Hey, I'd really like to take my builder trade in nationwide. What do you think? And he responded within like one second, like he was posed ready to go <laughs> waiting for my email and he goes why i'm like well that's easy number one i like to share number two i like to teach number three i'll probably learn more than they will and number four if i may make a buck or two god bless me and he said right answers more importantly right order so the number one thing I said, if you think back, number one, I like to share. It's just sharing with others allows you to grow. What you don't understand, if you have hatred in you, you better share it with someone or it's going to eat you alive. I'd be dead right now if I didn't share with the world and admit with the world my shortcomings. <laughs> I would never have a chance to make $8 billion if I didn't declare it to the word, to the world. Because I've got a great partner. He said, sure. What do you want? I'll help you on anything you want to do. And I believe in my heart. He's there. I, I just had the opportunity to give where I live in San Clemente. And I did a rental relief program. And I gave away $3,000. And I, that was one of the happiest moments of my life. I cried being able to give someone $3,000. And the guy that won it was overdrawn in his checking account by $500. He was shaking like a leaf. He called his mother. He started crying. He couldn't believe that someone would be willing to just arbitrarily help. So that's why I do what I do. Absolutely, absolutely love it. Um, in a short amount of time, I you you've delivered a bunch of value to to agents from thinking, you know, why become a CEO to the benefits and features of working with builders. And I know that agents are going to take away a lot. For sake of time, I do want to transition us into the last segment of our show, which is three, two, one, action. 
action. Steve, it's the same three questions that we ask every single guest. You're in studio on the hot seat. You ready to go? I was born ready. I know you were. So question number one, Joe. Yes, Steve. Who is the one most influential person on your business and why? Beth Ryder, because she's my partner. And everything that I do is based on how we interact with each other. And it's had some really, it's been, there's been some really tough times. And I, and I can say, as I've been learning, uh, I learned like anyone else, if you've got a partner and you're stressed, breathe slowly. <laughs> yeah. Walk away from the situation. Right. So it doesn't matter if your wife's your partner or your buddy or someone you don't even know. The same thing. Get a good partner. Always hire to your weakness. And if you're getting in a stressful situation, walk away and breathe. That's good advice right there. Question number two. What is the most influential book on your business and why? Dr. Wayne Dyer is the author. And uh, the most important thing that I took from him, he is a inspirational speaker who's passed. Uh, but I have a special product, uh, project out there that I would love help with. And if I have reach, boy, this would be the best time in my whole life to reach out. Uh, when the Boston bombing happened... I decided that I'd like to help, and I had a colleague that was the great-great-grandson of John Singleton Copley, who was named uh, the Copley Square downtown Boston. So long story short, he's a master artist, and we had a painting that we painted, and that painting is a uh, portrayal of what they call Watson and the shark. It's eight foot by seven foot. It's got a gold leaf frame. It's worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I want to donate it to the city of Boston. It has in the frame Boston forever strong. I've seen it. It's beautiful. And so Dr. Wayne Dyer says, and I walked out two years ago. I thought I had it donated to Copley Hotel and I had to put it back in storage. It's currently sitting in storage. Breaks my heart. And a good friend of mine said, Steve, like Dr. Wayne Dyer says, it's on its way. It'll arrive on time in larger amounts than you ever imagined. So if I can get that, have that happen and manifest that through people that know anyone in Boston that could help me, that would be a dream come true. I absolutely love that. Dr. Wayne Dyer. Uh, we'll have to look him up. I don't think I've read anything by him. Yeah, absolutely. The third and final question, Steve, is, as you know, this is the Owen Podcast, where we encourage our listeners to take what they've heard today and then begin to implement. So the last question is, what action item do you recommend for our listeners today so that they can go begin moving the needle forward in their business? So I just did a uh, coaching session. <clears throat> And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I just did a coaching session and uh, the agent I was coaching wants to do 24 transactions. And his question to me was, Steve, I just want to get these transactions done so I can then hire somebody. That's, that's not thinking the right way. You got to start with a much bigger, I said, so when you get that done, what are you going to do? He goes, well, then I'll hire someone. I'll start. I, so you're going to start all over? He goes, yeah. And I go, then what's your next goal? He goes, probably 100. And I go, then when you hit 100, what are you going to do? Start all over. I said, no, no, no. Why don't you build it for 500? Knowing that the road to 500 is through normally 10 first year, 24 second year, 50 the third year, Right? Then maybe 250 because you're learning and you're hiring people and you're leveraging. When it comes to real estate, it's about leverage, but you do not have to pay for leverage. It's one of the only professions in the world where if you're a magnet, meaning you're smart, you understand business acumen, you've read the millionaire real estate agent, at least as a base of your knowledge and you have plan and foresight, everyone will be attracted to you.
Steve, this is this is a lot of fun, um, and I know our listeners are going to want to um, connect with you. You've mentioned a couple websites throughout the conversation. What's the best way for a listener to find more of your content and connect with you? There's three ways, four ways to find me. You can reach out to Steve Ryder, R-I-D-E-R, at kw.com, and you'll reach me direct. You can find out about all of the things that I do at steveriderworld.com. And that encompasses my philanthropy and teaching and all the different stuff. My book, Change, has a song that goes with it. Then for business, you'll go to new, N-E-W, N-H-A, dot com. And you'll be able to click a button, get a free website. And that free website comes from the vendors that want to work with you. That's how I get it for free. There's no gimmick. They want to work with realtors, especially smart realtors. If you're a high level team and you're thinking, gee, that builder trade in sounds like an absolutely amazing opportunity. Go to buildertradein.com and take a look at my site. Well, so those are the four ways to find me. Awesome, Steve. Uh, we are grateful for your time today. Thank you for delivering value to our listeners. And we'll have to do it again sometime. Hey, I look forward to it. It's been great, guys. Thank you. Guys, this has been another episode of the All In Podcast. As always, go play All In. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening to this episode of the All In Podcast. We want to invite you to find all of today's resources from our show page at aipodcast.co. We also ask that you take just one minute to leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. This is how we grow and how we're able to bring you the best content each and every week. Now go play all in. All in.